So uh, my name is uh, Andy Stewart. Uh, I'm a partner uh, in the London office uh, in both our tech transactions group and in our corporate M&A practice. Uh, and uh, Rohith here um, is a partner in our tech transactions practice based uh, in California, about which I am insanely jealous. Um, we've been asked to talk today about how and why technology issues have become such a significant part of M&A deals. I'm sorry about that. I recognize one of those pictures. I'm not even sure my mother would recognize the other one. So there's the agenda. Uh, we're going to talk uh, a little bit about uh, the impact of the increasingly complex matrix uh, of technology and related contractual relationships uh, that uh, underpin targets operations uh, and make life difficult for sellers and buyers in M&A deals. Uh, and we're going to explain why that is and, and what you might try and do about it. And we're going to talk a little about the key legal issues to consider when planning uh, for the transition of the target uh, into the buyer's business uh, and the integration of all of those uh, uh, operations uh, into its own. Uh, but first, uh, Rohit is going to set the scene uh, with a little bit about the developing M&A landscape. All right. Oh, working. Good. All right. So let's see. Here we go. Uh, so how has the M&A landscape been changing over the past several years? Uh, what types of deals are companies looking to make? Uh, to help answer that question, we have uh, the results of a set of surveys conducted by PwC uh, over the past six years. Uh, the survey was conducted on a sampling of over 150 executives at Fortune 1,000 companies. Uh, for this particular question, they were asked, uh, how would they characterize the largest deal that they've undertaken in the past three years? Uh, what jumps out at me is uh, the significant increase uh, in the transformational deals that uh, companies are doing from 2010 at 29% to uh, over half in 2016, 54%. Uh, and a transformational deal for purposes of the survey was defined as uh, a deal involving the acquisition of new markets, uh, new technologies, new products, uh, all in a way that would result in a transformation of the final uh, integrated company. Uh, so what, what is causing this big uptick in uh, transformational deals? Uh, PwC concluded, and uh, we would agree, uh, that one of the primary reasons for this is uh, because companies are under intense pressure to innovate, uh, and as a result, they're using uh, M&A transactions, M&A deals, uh, to attain new capabilities uh, that they need to be competitive. And that means, in many instances, uh, integrating two very different business models, uh, two very different business cultures, uh, and complicated technologies. Uh, so it's no surprise, then, that the real challenge becomes integration. Uh, this chart is from a survey conducted by Deloitte and published late last year. Uh, it w they surveyed over 1,000 executives, and that's what the most important factor was in determining a successful M&A transaction. Uh, the results show that the number one factor, as perceived by these executives, uh, was integration of the acquired target. Uh, so with the growth and desire uh, of companies uh, to use M&A as a strategy for uh, transforming their business and uh, the real resulting clash uh, in business cultures, uh, in business models, uh, it's apparent that a major interest for sellers on one hand uh, is to set up an attractive target uh, for uh, buyers, and on the other hand, uh, for buyers to prepare and plan uh, for the eventual integration of uh, as early and efficiently as possible. So, what role really does the technology lawyer uh, play in this changing landscape? Uh, with the uptick in transformational deals and really with the change in how all companies do, businesses today, do business today, uh, technology and related co contracts are not an afterthought in any M&A deal. Uh, technology can often be core to how a company, op company operates its business, uh, especially if you're considering or seeking innovation as part of your M&A transaction. Uh, as a result, the target systems, their platform, the technology, uh, can be a big factor in the valuation of that uh, company. Uh, and technology issues are often the trickiest elements of an M&A deal, uh, especially when it comes to unwinding and separating uh, for the seller and, uh, you know, reassembling and integrating, on the other hand, for the buyer. Uh, so I, I really couldn't tell you the number of deals I've been involved in over the past few years, uh, 
uh, were the biggest factor uh, in the value of the deal and what was your driving the desire of the buyer to get the deal done uh, was because they wanted an enabling system or technology or they wanted to enter into a particular line of business, uh, but the only way they could do it was uh, with a fully capable and functioning product or platform uh, that they wouldn't have to build from scratch. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not as simple as uh, plug and play in every scenario. So let's talk a little bit about why that's the case. Uh, okay, so your, your deal team comes to you with a plan to acquire business. Uh, let's say you're a financial institution uh, that provides uh, automobile loans or dealers. Uh, you want to start lending directly to customers. Uh, so you're looking at a target company that already has that capability. Uh, in the past, you do your diligence uh, on the business. It looks a lot like this. Uh, the core business is the direct-to-consumer uh, lending loan platform. And then there are a whole bunch of non-core but uh, enabling departments within the company uh, that are necessary to actually run the company. Uh, once you bought this business, it would be mostly a matter of plugging in your own existing infrastructure, integrating a little bit of the rest, uh, and letting the business run. Uh, today, of course, this is not what a target, uh, target business looks like. Many of the non-core functions have been, uh, that we just discussed have been outsourced. Uh, some of the enabling software is, is licensed. Uh, the direct-to-consumer auto lending camp company, in my, in my example, uh, has a digital lending platform that, uh, for, for example, hosts much of its data in uh, an Amazon Web Services cloud, or uh, perhaps it's licensing uh, SAP software uh, for uh, HR functions. Uh, if it turns out, in addition, that this company is part of a larger organization, this business is part of a larger enterprise, uh, let's say another financial institution, then it uh, gets even more interesting because it's very likely that uh, many of these non-core functions have been centralized. Uh, and the parent may be the one with the contract with AWS, for example, and the license with SAP. Uh, they may be the ones providing the HR and IT functions through a shared service organization. Uh, so when we're talking about what a modern company actually looks like for an M&A deal, it looks a lot more like uh, this. Uh, you have some contracts that are dedicated to the business that you're actually selling or acquiring. Uh, you have some that are enterprise-wide and provided centrally through a, a seller. Uh, or So rather than a standalone company, you're looking at a core business surrounded by a complex matrix of enabling uh, services and technologies uh, that are provided either externally through a third party or uh, internally through affiliates. Uh, and that's where we want to focus our discussion. Okay, so, so what issues does this present for your M&A deal? So let's, let's start with uh, the simpler set of issues uh, relating to dedicated agreements. Uh, the on-premise software license. Uh, maybe it's a contract with a, a credit reporting agency to provide data regarding loan applicants. Uh, at its most straightforward, uh, in the stock sale, the, the contract simply moves uh, with the target business buyer. Uh, but what you would watch out for are any, uh, any provisions that trigger uh, a third-party termination right on a change of control. If it's not a stock sale, uh, if it's an asset sale, uh, these edited, uh, uh, the contract would actually need to be assigned, uh, so you'd be looking out for prohibitions on assignment. In general, you want to be aware of uh, any disclosure restrictions that would prevent you sharing the agreement with the buyer as part of uh, diligence. Uh, in addition, even with dedicated agreements, uh, if the pricing was based on some type of enterprise-wide commitments, uh, you'd want to make sure there are no pricing renegotiation triggers as a result of the divestiture. Uh, even if you have all of these restrictions in place, though, uh, the primary issue for these dedicated agreements is a matter of cost, uh, because no matter what your contract says, you can negotiate uh, the consent at the right price. So the challenge is really knowing what consents are necessary, uh, which ones, uh, who will pay for them, and what are the workarounds if you can't uh, get the consent in time, or if you, if you ultimately can't, can't get the consent at all. So while dedicated agreements are fairly straightforward, uh, shared agreements present uh, more issues. And now this could be your, your AWS contract if it's an enterprise-wide cloud deal uh, or an outsourced master agreement for IT services. Uh, these cannot be assigned to the buyer because the seller, of course, requires continued use of those services. And there are a few options, each of which come with their own issues. Uh, the contract can be cloned for the buyer. Uh, the question is really whether having a duplicate contract makes sense uh, for the divested entity. Uh, there may be revenue or volume commitments that, uh, that aren't appropriate for a smaller entity. There may be uh, the scope, maybe the, por the portion of the scope that are simply inapplicable to the new divested entity. Uh, so when cloning isn't a viable option, uh, 
uh, the contract can be cleaved uh, to split the scope uh, and split the revenue commitments and allocate them appropriately between the seller uh, and the divested entity. Uh, the issue here is that this typically involves uh, much more negotiating time at a, at a point in the deal when you really are in a rush to get things done. So barring those options, uh, the seller can potentially retain the contract uh, and provide continued services uh, through a TSA arrangement. Uh, and we'll talk about that a bit more in later slides. So we've talked about uh, some of the issues presented by a modern M&A deal. Let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, strategies to help address these issues, uh, starting really from the seller's perspective. Uh, the seller's goal, uh, obviously, is to uh, present an, as attractive a target as possible uh, in order to maximize uh, the value of the deal. Uh, given that integration, as we saw, is perhaps the number one concern uh, for buyers, uh, the goal then for the seller is to uh, provide a target that the seller can be confident and understands, uh, that it can successfully integrate that target into its business. Uh, so how can the seller go about doing that? Uh, we think the first step and the most obvious, uh, in which many of you have obviously already done, is to standardize terms and negotiate M&A ready agreements as part of your uh, steady state run operation. Uh, and, you know, this will address some of the issues that we've already uh, discussed, and we'll talk a bit more on the next slide about what an M&A ready agreement looks like. Uh, but standardized contract terms make diligence much easier and much faster uh, for a buyer. Uh, does that mean you're going to necessarily be able to move every agreement onto your paper? Uh, probably not. Uh, you're not going to necessarily get Amazon off of their paper. You're not going to necessarily get Google off their paper. But uh, the more you've done in this area, uh, the more confident the buyer is uh, that, the, that the terms of the contracts they're looking at have the flexibility they need to, to, to take them over. Now, the next step is to maintain a database of agreements for the target business. You really need to understand which are the, the dedicated agreements, which are the shared agreements, uh, which ones have deviations from the standard terms, which allow transitional service agreements. Uh, and this limits the unknown, uh, the, the fear of the unknown for the buyer to a certain extent. Uh, and, and you have to understand there's, you know, as part of this, there's also a bit of a disclosure paradox associated with any M&A transaction. You want to share information in order to make the buyer confident, but at the same time, you don't want to share too much information until you get to a state that uh, you're confident the transaction will actually proceed. Uh, so this type of database is a, a good intermediate step uh, before you get to actually sharing contracts uh, with the buyer. Uh, you will want to perform seller side due diligence on the target. Really, you need to understand your own company's capabilities, its own needs. Uh, it may be possible that some agreements, some technologies uh, that they've licensed out, uh, they have a solution for that they don't necessarily need to transfer. Uh, it may be that others are mission critical. Uh, if the seller knows what, what their company actually looks like, they can share this and it will uh, increase the buyer's confidence. Uh, and then if you have internal shared service organizations as part of a wider enterprise and you're providing these services out to you, all of your subsidiaries, it's helpful to structure these organizations as much like an outside service provider as possible. That greatly simplifies the separation process uh, for these internal agreements because uh, they're already running to some extent, uh, like uh, the, the, the post-sale reality. Uh, along with the foregoing, um, if you are able to identify any particular in-flight projects that you have going, uh, it's often smart to suspend those uh, because uh, the buyer strategies and the buyer's needs may, may be in conflict with what uh, you're currently on your way to doing. Uh, they may have their own ERP implementation quite underway or already implemented, and so there's no need to really uh, progress along a path that uh, the buyer may not be interested in. So uh, on this slide, I, I won't spend too much time on these provisions. Uh, they're, they're pretty straightforward. Um, you know, what did I mean actually by making your agreements M&A ready? Uh, it's really all about planning. Uh, none of you in this room will be surprised by any of these uh, items on the screen. Uh, and when it comes time to the best of company, you'll probably negotiate all of these rights into your existing agreements. Uh, but at that point, it's a matter, again, of price and cost. Uh, if, on the other hand, you've been thinking about these issues up front when you're entering into these agreements as part of your uh, steady state, and you can show that to your buyer, uh, you're, they're more likely to believe you have that flexibility. So uh, a couple of ones, uh, you know, that, that do address some of the issues I uh, pointed out earlier, uh, the right to assign, the right to disclose, the, the ability to extend use out to a divested entity for a period of time, uh, 
Uh, one, one additional one that I'd like to touch on uh, is the point about minimizing other restrictions uh, that may perhaps seem acceptable in your current state, uh, but aren't, are or could be problematic uh, from an M&A perspective. So requiring use at only specific sites uh, or in specific ways or on specific computers, in a license agreement, having a defined term for use that excludes external parties, uh, so on. Uh, so we've talked about some of the most common strategies for a, a seller to address technology and M&A and related M&A issues. Uh, let me hand it over to Andy here to uh, talk about some additional strategies and also I think pivot to, uh, to talking about the, <laughs> the buyer's perspective on all this. I'm now going to confuse Rohit, no end by interleaving my um, notes into his when he comes to try and pick up his notes. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes. So we've talked a bit uh, about what you might do when planning your M&A strategy, and quite a lot of that, uh, as Rohit has already said, uh, assumes um, you're putting in place, you're kind of putting in place technology contracts now or, or your uh, technology contracts are all in great shape already. Um, but of course, uh, the nature of uh, the business that we're all in, uh, a lot of these complexities have arisen uh, sort of step by step um, over quite a few uh, years now. So it's often with hindsight that you're looking at an M&A deal and realizing that perhaps you would have done your agreements differently uh, if you'd had your time again. Um, so, uh, well, so what are people doing um, to try and uh, deal with that? Uh, obviously, if you happen to have a nice, neatly planned uh, renegotiation of those agreements coming up uh, that fits with your uh, M&A timetable, uh, then you can perhaps have a go at fixing it then. But, but interestingly, we're seeing um, uh, a move towards uh, some clients actually starting to take the time and effort to uh, negotiate uh, sort of standalone um, uh, agreements of this type. So in effect, uh, anticipating an M&A deal or a series of M&A deals uh, and actually going to service providers and uh, effectively putting in place standalone uh, documents fully fleshed out uh, so that uh, at the point of uh, M&A they are able to uh, say to their potential buyers, um, don't worry, this uh, organization is, uh, is good to go. Uh, and those contracts um, uh, are designed to provide the target um, with everything that it uh, needs. Um, they are disclosable, um, as Rohit has uh, talked about. They don't contain JG control provisions, um, and they don't contain prohibition on assignment. So, it, so in effect, uh, if you get a chance to do that, and you get a chance to do that properly, um, then you are um, taking one of the sort of hurdles out of the way uh, of your M&A deal if you have one of these sort of highly complex uh, back office contractual structures. Uh, so that's an interesting development. Another interesting one is, um, is uh, a sort of hypercare solution. Um, so particularly useful where uh, sellers, uh, the people with all the knowledge uh, of the, uh, the technology and the contracts uh, that underpin it are staying uh, with the seller, they're not going with the target, um, or perhaps the, uh, uh, the, the buyer um, is not familiar with the, um, uh, that uh, product at all. Uh, or technology at all. Um, and so um, clients are putting in place um, sort of standalone uh, hypercare uh, contracts. So it's sort of a, an extra special level of care uh, for um, usually about a sort of three month period to see uh, the target through from the transition from uh, seller to buyer. Um, who pays for that sort of thing obviously tends to be very interesting in, in M&A transactions. Uh, and that will really just be a, uh, an acquisition uh, price um, as part of that deal, part of the negotiations. But really when we're, uh, when we're um, hearing about this from clients, that's got less to do with the price of the service and more to do with uh, acknowledging the need to make the target more sellable. So interesting, uh, interesting developments. And that would have been the slide we went with it. <laughs> So um, are there advantages and disadvantages? Um, so we, we don't want to exaggerate um, how successful um, those kind of options are. Uh, I'm sure you can probably already see some, uh, some, uh, some difficulties. If you can get them right, 
fantastic. But there are there are pitfalls. Uh, time and money, um, probably uh, the most obvious ones. Um, in the middle of an M&A timetable, is it really practical to devote the time necessary uh, to put in place one of these um, one of these agreements? Uh, then M&A periods are not renowned for their relaxed, stress-free environment that enables that sort of extra work to be done. Uh, and also, the dynamics of an M&A deal um, are usually driven by other people. Um, so uh, timetables and the like are not necessarily within the gift of the people that might be involved with this. Um, the, the seller's bargaining position with the service provider when looking to put in place one of these things um, is not necessarily ideal. Uh, the the uh, service provider might um, regard that as uh, a less interesting project um, by taking something big and turning it into something small. Um, but nevertheless, you can also see service providers who actually see this as an opportunity uh, to get a new customer. So there's a, a sort of plus and minus there. Trying to, um, trying to price. Uh, one of these things, um, not necessarily easy. You know, if you've got a commingled uh, operation, then uh, extracting all the data necessary to price one of these um, uh, one of these agreements not necessarily ideal. Volume projections might be difficult. Uh, baselining, true up, all of those sort of things come into play, which don't necessarily lend themselves to an M and A uh, transaction. And even if you are able to do all of those things. Uh, of course, part of the irritation is no two buyers are the same. You, you could come up with something which is perfect, uh, makes the target uh, neatly stand alone, and then discover that the only buyer in town is not remotely interested in that solution. Uh, so it's not it's not a uh, it's not a perfect solution. Um, and you may, of course, as we say on the slide there, uh, even even if you do come up with a price for this, the uh, the buyer uh, might just say not interested in uh, in paying that price. Um, and cynics would suggest, of course, buyers always say they're not willing to pay that price. But, but it is worth keeping these things in mind. Um, I, I think it's probably fair to say um, early stages for this. Um, you might call it the very well-organized end of a spectrum, perhaps. Um, but we think it's worth just worth keeping an eye on those on those developments. There's a lot of M&A techniques now that uh, people regard as normal, um, which were uh, regarded as not normal at all um, before. Uh, so as this development, um, uh, it's kind of a watch this space. Um, but as, as these sort of complexities are just not going to go away, somebody's going to spot, spot a business opportunity, and, uh, and perhaps that will be it. So we started these things primarily uh, with the seller in mind. We've started now the shift to the buyer in that last uh, section. Let's try and do a little bit more of that. Um, as, as Rohith uh, emphasized uh, at the start, effective integration is seen as the most important factor in a successful acquisition, and, and yet loads of studies um, show that the majority of mergers fail to create significant shareholder value, with poor integration frequently blamed. Uh, a recent Bain study, uh, two of the top four reasons for failed corporate marriages related to poor integration, apparently. So is that all down to the failure to plan properly for the integration? Uh, of the technology and related contracts? Of, of course not. Uh, an EY study says 26% um, of respondents uh, blamed IT uh, failings for uh, uh, post-transaction integration issues. So it's not the only thing, but it is nevertheless very relevant. Um, lots of other factors are described. Uh, you see them on uh, examples of them on the screen there. Finance, logistics, culture, organization, these are issues which cause significant integration issues on an M&A deal, but each and every one of those, uh, in fact, can be uh, underpinned by a technology problem. Uh, financial problem, that could be accounting software related. Uh, logistical issues, that could be um, one organization's uh, data centers versus another organization's cloud solution. Uh, cultural issues, they can arise uh, because one, one organization loves one set of applications and systems, and the other organization has something entirely different. Um, actually, I could probably pause there and say we even saw that with Mayor Brown um, mergers uh, over the years, but perhaps that's another story. Organizational, <laughs> organizational issues. If, you, if one organization um, uh, reports uh, and project manages using one set of systems and the other does uh, an entirely different way, big issue. So technology relevant 
um, in so many ways to integration, both directly and indirectly. So what should a buyer do? Um, well, uh, we've already seen no, no two buyers are the same. Uh, you can have a private equity firm, for example, uh, buying something, absolutely no integration, no operations rather to integrate into it at all. Uh, probably needs lots of support in uh, trying, to, trying to get that uh, target from the seller into its hands. Uh, but an operational or a trade buyer um, may have its own infrastructure um, and may need very little in the way of additional uh, help or, or services. Uh, and you can even have the same type of buyer with two entirely different approaches. Uh, as I saw just uh, just very recently, uh, we were trying to dispose of a, a brand, so wearing my M&A hat, trying to dispose of a brand from an organization with an incredibly complicated European uh, uh, supply chain structure. And basically, um, it, all of its business was uh, commingled through everything from sourcing of raw materials to delivering finished goods. Uh, so extracting the brand and handing it to somebody else uh, was, was a nightmare. Uh, and indeed, the first preferred buyer uh, was all over that stuff. And we spent uh, many, many hours uh, battling away, fighting over all of uh, the detail uh, to get that uh, sorted out. That buyer then eventually decided not to do the deal for different reasons, I'm pleased to say. Um, next buyer comes along, we, uh, we take a deep breath, we sit down uh, across the table with them for the first time, ready to have this fight all over again. We explain the problem and they say, don't worry, that's fine. And that was it. Didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Uh, so, last one. yeah, sorry, no two, no two uh, targets are the same as well. Um, so obviously, if you're if you're uh, picking up a brand as I just described, incredibly complex, um, you're just shifting over assets. Uh, then that's that's hard work uh, to integrate. But if you've got a uh, if you're just doing a, a bog standard stock purchase, much more straightforward. You might have more the luxury of more time to integrate uh, as going forward. No one size fits all approach. Um, so what can buyers do in advance to integrate the, uh, the, the target or to, to assist with that? Um, uh, some similar themes to the ones uh, Rohith was talking about from the other side of the fence. Uh, plan in advance, assume you're going to do M&A, make sure if you can you've got expansion rights uh, and support rights in your own technology contracts. Uh, make sure you have people on your, your acquisition team who understand this stuff. Amazing the number of times we see uh, uh, M&A deals where these things are hugely important, but for a variety of reasons, sometimes confidentiality, um, uh, sometimes ego even. You, these guys don't get a chance to get a, a place at the table. Um, so uh, buyers are missing out on the ability to be much better prepared than they can be. Um, use the documentation and diligence. Again, we see clients who will do lots of diligence in this area and then seemingly just tuck it away in a drawer somewhere, uh, never to do anything further with it. Uh, talking about the well-organized end of the spectrum, um, some, uh, some buyers come along with their own version of a transitional services agreement. Uh, they actually make it a, a condition of their offer, uh, again, in a similar way to how Rohith was describing. Um, you know, if you're in an M&A deal and you're a buyer in an auction process, you're probably going to find the suppliers unmoved, so the seller rather, is unmoved by the idea of using your paper, but nevertheless, it helps to focus uh, the mind. Uh, and of course, build all of that into an integration plan. So, um, last slide for me, technology integration transition issues for buyers. So you've got your uh, integration plan in mind. What are the kind of questions that you need to think about from a detailed perspective, as I desperately try and remove my papers from Rohith's? <laughs> um, here are a few key ones. Um, how, how can you as the buyer maintain flexibility? Um, what services are needed and when? Uh, how do you keep a, a seller motivated um, if, you're, if they're going to provide support um, uh, post-closing? Um, how do you allocate costs uh, for the new data security reality? Um, what happens if you need more time for transitioning and integration than you thought you would? What happens if you need, in fact, less time? Uh, how do you get the right people on board? What are the performance requirements that you should be looking for? Um, are you sure even that the seller has the rights to provide the services that they're claiming they will give you post-closing? All of these things are very interesting. 
and Rohith is going to give you all the answers. <laughs> Good leader. Mm -hmm. I think I've left your phone. <laughs> you just took the most important one. <laughs> um, Shout out if you need me. Thank you, Andy. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, so, so the buyer can't solve all of these integration issues uh, through the purchase agreement. Uh, and we've talked about having the right people on the acquisition team, doing all the appropriate diligence, uh, having an integration plan. Uh, but for transformational deals especially, and we've talked about how that is uh, a large, there's a trend towards those types of deals, uh, you really need the assistance of the seller. Uh, and, at, and that's at a point where the seller is really no longer motivated uh, to really assist. Uh, so it's going to be critical to have a robust TSA in place to address many of the issues that uh, Andy just mentioned. Uh, first, uh, we need to have an appropriate term for each transitional service agreement or transi transitional service. Uh, your, <coughs> your integration plan may indicate that it'll take you, uh, for example, three months to move uh, data, uh, the target's data off of its cloud or off of its servers uh, into your own arrangement. Uh, but it may take a year, uh, on the other hand, to fully replace a uh, outsourced, uh, complicated master outsourcing agreement uh, that the, s the seller currently has in place. So, um, you know, it, having uh, unique terms for each service, uh, transitional service makes sense. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, your, the best laid plans rarely survive, um, you know, the first contact with the, I'm just thinking it's mixed up two uh, metaphors, but uh, battle plans rarely survive the first contact with the enemy. So uh, you, you need to have the ability to, to have a, a right in the, under the agreement for, for reasonable extension periods. Uh, with perhaps uh, an outside cap that makes sense for the seller. Obviously, the seller's not going to be providing transitional services to you for, to you for five years, but uh, you, you do need some flexibility to actually extend as uh, your integration plans may shift and change. Uh, and if things go smoother than anticipated, uh, you need the ability to, to disengage earlier. Um, and the seller obviously will have most likely no problem with that, uh, but it should be a right that you have. Um, in addition, you'll lose, you know, as we talked about, you lose leverage as soon as the deal is signed, as soon as the purchase agreement is, is, is executed. So if the scope of work is really limited to what is in the TSA, uh, you're really relying on the good nature, the good heart of the, of the seller uh, to go back and get anything that you may have omitted uh, that's related uh, and ancillary to actual services that you need, uh, but is uh, necessary for you and impractical for you to obtain on your own. Uh, so having the ability to go back and uh, request ancillary services to the service provider or the service provider for the seller uh, is required to provide as long as they have been providing a similar service uh, to their own target or the, to their own entity before the sale happened. Um, sometimes when you're purchasing a business for its platform or its technology, uh, there are really certain key individuals that are absolutely critical to understanding and integrating uh, that business with your own and if they transfer over as part of the, the purchase agreement, if they transfer over uh, at that point, great, uh, no issues. But if they are staying with the seller, then you would need to have some key personnel provisions as you would have in any normal uh, outsourced agreement or any service provider agreement to ensure that they aren't transitioned away as soon as the purchase agreement is signed. Uh, on pricing, uh, you will want price certainty, uh, so will the seller. Uh, the seller isn't running the TSA services as a profit center. So there shouldn't be too much tension on this issue, but uh, you do want to avoid prices, uh, surprises. Uh, in addition, we were talking about how, and think Andy mentioned how, how would you motivate the uh, seller during the TSA period. Uh, we have seen on deals where technology is a, uh, the technology or the platform is a critical element uh, or a critical value driver for the deal. We have seen escrow provisions that, uh, uh, that uh, or buyers actually successfully negotiate escrow provisions that uh, condition uh, portions of the purchase price and the release of the purchase price uh, upon achieving certain milestones in the integration process. Um, IP rights, so you, you spend all this time and effort in the purchase agreement negotiating uh, extensive uh, allocation of IP uh, during the, uh, as part of the purchase. Uh, the last thing you would want to do is muddy those waters during the transition period. Uh, so. There should be clarity on who owns what, uh, who retains ownership to what during this period. And if there are any new items developed, whether by the seller itself or uh, by a service provider for the seller, uh, for both you and the seller, who actually retains or has ownership of those new items. Uh, 
uh, and Andy mentioned privacy and data security. Uh, as you know, there's a new reality here once the, the, the sale has occurred, and that is that the target is no longer part of the seller's enterprise, and there may be a period where your data, your target's data, your, your acquisition's data is sitting on their servers or in their cloud. Uh, you know, let's address how that data is going to be segregated, what, what safeguards are going to be put in place, uh, how access rights are going to be handled. Uh, you, can, you can cross your fingers and, and hope that there is no breach during this period, but uh, that's not really going to be an acceptable uh, solution or answer for either side if something does happen. Uh, so having those provisions is critical. Uh, and then, you know, on indemnities and, and, and limitations of liability, obviously the seller is not going to want to put much into the TSA in the way of indemnities or want to accept much in the way of, uh, of uh, potential liability. Obviously, uh, as I said, this isn't a profit center for them, uh, but uh, as a buyer, you do need to be protected in case the seller doesn't do what it uh, says it will do if they, if they didn't get a consent from a software provider uh, and it turns out that uh, you don't have a right to use what they've been providing you. Uh, is, is, is the seller going to protect you from that? Uh, if they breach the other agreement, uh, the agreement, the TSA in other ways, uh, what, what type of skin uh, do they have in the game to ensure that, you're, that they're, they're focused on those kinds of issues? Uh, and what that amount will be? Uh, is probably very dependent on what the nature is of the CSA services uh, and the particulars of the transaction and, and obviously the leverage you have. Uh, but you do need to strike a balance here because what the seller is actually providing to you, as we talked about, is critical for your integration efforts. And so uh, it's, it can't be simply provided as is, whereas with, with no representations and no guarantees whatsoever. So. So you'll notice that we really didn't, uh, so key messages, so we didn't really get into any purchase agreement issues, you know, how to negotiate IP reps and warranties, uh, you know, how to handle privacy issues during the purchase agreement. It's possible uh, to do an entirely separate presentation on those issues, uh, and we included those by design. What we have tried to focus on uh, our discussion on today uh, is more on the before and the after of a modern M&A deal. Um, as we saw, the types of deals uh, that your companies are doing, uh, that most major companies are doing, are trending towards the more transformational, uh, and this involves acquiring really new, uh, new, new product lines, new technologies, new channels for them, uh, and, and that, as a result, will often require a very substantial amount of integration effort as it pertains to the related technologies uh, and services. So for both the seller and the buyer, then, uh, it's, its technology issues do need to be front and center in the M&A planning process. Uh, and even with the planning, uh, you know, whether you're the buyer and the seller, you need to be flexible uh, to react to the reality as it may change over time. Uh, so no matter how much you plan for a particular buyer buying situation, uh, it may be that you need to shift gears and move in a different, different direction. And, and finally, in this construct and in this landscape, uh, having the capability uh, and the process uh, in place to provide uh, effective TSA services uh, is critical to both the buyer uh, as well as the seller, uh, both in maximizing the potential value and the attractiveness of the target that you're trying to sell, uh, and as well as uh, in increasing the likelihood on the buyer side uh, of a successful integration. And that brings us to the close. Any questions? Uh, two questions. The transformational deals, are you seeing those more as auctions or as just people going out and trying to broker deals in private? Uh, if it's somebody's going to build, sorry. It's not easy to get tech transactions to work. Yeah, <laughs> I love the M&A lawyer to answer that question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, transformational deals, I, mean, I think truly transformational deals are almost certainly going to be uh, auction related because the uh, uh, if it's going to be transformational, then the seller must know that and so is going out into the market and maximizing its price, and that will tend to be through an auction process. And uh, on the buyer side, how does the like issues with working capital relate to keeping sellers motivated or vice versa? Uh, so I would say that um, one, one of the ways, because one of the, the problems that Rohit was uh, identifying there around uh, transitional services, around uh, the supplier saying, the, the seller rather saying, I'm, you know, I can't give you much of a standard here. This is not my core business. It's not a revenue stream. Um, and there are, you know, that you can see logical reasons for why that is true. Uh, 
um, in which case what you're looking to do is then um, uh, find other parts of the wider sale deal to say that's fine but if you're not going to you know if, you, if we're not getting what we need um, then we're going to um, we're going to find another way of hitting you and if it's not the performance of the TSA then that's fine but we'll penalize you through, through some other way and that might be through uh, things like the completion accounts adjustment um, or you, you look for something that will give you a, um, a leverage uh, um, to keep the supplier, I keep saying supplier, seller, honest. All right. Thank you, everyone.